Hello and welcome to this 3IE video on meta-analysis. My name's Hugh Waddington. Uh, in this video I'm going to explain why meta-analysis is not just one of a range of methods that can be used to learn lessons for decision making, but is usually the appropriate method. And I'm going to use examples from 3IE studies on microcredit programs and land reform. So 20 years ago, the use of before versus after studies to test impact was very common. But now we know that we need solid counterfactuals to answer whether development programs in a particular context really work. And there are literally thousands of impact studies, as 3IE has estimated. But many of these are context dependent, or of low quality, or reported in a way that makes it difficult to determine policy lessons. So really important key additional work is needed to extract findings, critically appraise evidence, and assess how generalizable is the evidence. 3IE estimates that there are over 400 completed systematic reviews in our database on development interventions. These are right across the range of sectors, including, for example, education, financial inclusion, governance, labor markets, wash sector, and so on. Many of these studies use methods to synthesize evidence that doesn't give an answer, such as vote counting. Vote counting is where the results of positive and negative findings are summed and the category with the most votes is attributed as the winner. For example, in the slides you'll see some findings from studies on the, of the effectiveness of microcredit in empowering women. These are taken from a systematic review by Jos Weissen and colleagues. If Weissen and authors had used vote counting, they would have determined that 14 studies estimated positive impacts, whereas five estimated negative impacts. So they would have concluded, on the whole, that microcredit is effective in empowering women. On the other hand, meta-analysis, which is the statistical appraisal and pooling of evidence from multiple studies, gives a clear answer. Microcredit alone, and, and that answer is that microcredit alone does not empower women. All studies in, in Jos Weissen's meta-analysis measure empowerment as women's control over household spending decisions. And in the forest plot on your screen, you'll see the meta-analysis for this outcome. So each individual study is shown vertically, together with its effect size and confidence interval. The effect size measures the standardized change in outcome for women in microcredit groups compared to the, to the same outcome for women not in microcredit groups. And the vertical line shows the point at which there is no change in the outcome. Finally, the diamond at the bottom shows the pooled effect across all studies, which is estimated statistically using meta-analysis as the weighted average. So the forest plot shows both the likely effect of a typical microcredit scheme, which is the diamond, and also how the individual findings vary across contexts, which in this case is not very much. So, how do we come to such different conclusions about effectiveness using meta-analysis versus other methods like vote counting? And this is what I'm going to explain in the rest of this video. Meta-analysis was developed by US social scientists in the 1970s. It collects data at the study level so the unit of analysis in meta-analysis is usually a study-level observation such as the impact effect or the average treatment effect. Meta-analysis is the standard approach to evidence synthesis in medicine under Cochrane, which is an organization established in 1994. And with the advent of the Campbell Collaboration in 1999, it's in increasingly being used to synthesize evidence in criminology, education, and social work. This is, these are largely studies conducted in high-income countries. But due to 3IE, which established the International Development Coordinating Group, or IDCG, under the, C the Campbell Collaboration in 2011, meta-analysis is now being applied to development interventions. We can distinguish four main steps to conducting meta-analysis. In the first step, we choose the scope of the meta-analysis and data collection. The scope might be a broad topic like what works in improving school participation and learning, or on a more narrow topic like the impacts of land tenure reform on farm productivity. In the second step, we ensure there is no double counting of evidence by determining independent findings. In the third step, 
We appraise both the individual studies included in the meta-analysis as well as the body of evidence overall to determine its reliability. And in the fourth step, we synthesize the evidence to determine, firstly, the likely effect of a typical intervention. Secondly, the variation in effects, for example, in resource poor contexts or for vulnerable groups. And finally, the reasons for differences in variation through what we call causal mediator and moderator analyses. Meta-analysis may be done for selected studies or as a result of systematic searches for evidence. We need to collect studies systematically, in other words, regardless of who has funded or implemented the program, if we want to learn lessons for development effectiveness. Where studies are not collected systematically, we cannot be sure that they are representative of the body of evidence. This is particularly problematic when meta-analyses exclude or do not search systematically for unpublished studies. That's, that is studies not published in peer review journals. And when this is the case, the lessons learned may be biased. As I said, in meta-analysis, the unit of analysis is the study level effect. We need to ensure that we isolate independent effects so that we don't double count any evidence. But we know that many studies are published in multiple formats. For example, journal articles, working papers, and technical reports on the same evidence, or multiple journal articles uh, in using what we call salami slicing. In policy-relevant meta-analysis, the unit of analysis needs to be set at the program level, and analysis done to ensure that only independent effects of programs are calculated. For example, in the VICE and meta-analysis on microcredit, there were seven studies from Bangladesh, but only three represented independent estimates. The others were from different estimates and publications from the same data sources. In Pakistan, on the other hand, while there were two studies, both were of different programs, so that was fine. These two estimates could be included. In step three, we assess bias in the study so we can separate the wheat from the chaff. There are reasons at the individual study level and for the whole body of studies why we might not trust the findings. So we assess bias to account for the following. Confounding. For example, do self-help groups empower women, or is it that empowered women form self-help groups? Second example, bias due to measurement error. If we conduct a survey asking women members of self-help groups if they experience violence in the home, are they always likely to tell us the truth? We know that measuring women, women's experience of empowerment is challenging, and there are many reasons why women might be more likely to report experience of violence. Another case, reporting biases. Authors and journal editors like positive findings as they think null findings or insignificant findings don't tell us anything interesting. But you really shouldn't trust everything you read in a peer review journal. And there is much evidence, including from many meta-analyses on development topics, that journals are more likely to publish studies finding positive effects. So the bias assessment is done using structured questions for different categories of bias by two reviewers working independently and reported transparently. One of the most useful and interesting things meta-analysis can do is to quantify the extent of bias. On your screens are the results from bias assessments, including publication bias, for, for contract farming, agricultural extension, and microcredit. These indicate that the true effects of programs are likely to be much lower than those found in typical journal articles. For example, we found the effect of farmer field schools on agricultural yields was one third smaller when we accounted for publication via than when we didn't. This is a big impact and would indeed make a big difference to a typical farm household. In the fourth step, we synthesize the evidence. And the synthesis can be narrative or statistical. So narrative synthesis should usually be done along the causal chain. Um, for example, in a review of land tenure reform, the causal chain would, would usually go from access to credit to improved investment, and improved farm production, um, and improved household welfare. Synthesis can also be statistical by pooling across studies for particular outcomes using meta-analysis. Finally, synthesis can be both statistical within and across studies, but probably the single most policy-relevant reason for doing meta-analysis is that it gives an answer where single studies can't. And this is because of the power of meta-analysis to account for the larger sample sizes from multiple studies. On your screen, the forest plot shows effects of self-help group programs funded by Oxfam 
on women's experience of violence. There are nine individual studies from lots of different contexts, each of which were unable to conclude that the program had an effect. But the pooled findings from the meta-analysis, shown again in the diamond at the bottom of the screen, indicate that for these programs there is an effect, so the policy conclusions are really quite different. But there are legitimate concerns about pooling across different contexts. So some meta-analyses may do all the steps I've just spoken about, but stop at the pooling of evidence. But even here, meta-analysis can help reveal reconcilable differences, which is something that Ian Chalmers famously said. On your screens, you see the meta-analysis by Stephen Laurie and Cyrus Sammy and co-authors. This meta-analysis looks at the impacts of land tenure reforms on productivity. It shows very clearly that the programs in Asia and Latin America, which are shown in the top part of the figure, are highly effective. But it also shows that programs in sub-Saharan Africa are less effective, which are shown in the, in the lower part of the figure. The authors concluded that this was because land reforms were being implemented in circumstances either where traditional tenure rights provided security for farmers, or because reforms were not implemented alongside complementary measures to improve access to credit and other inputs. So, to conclude this video, meta-analysis gives answers that implementers need. It can tell us the likely effect of a program, but also, importantly, how effects are likely to differ by context. It helps adjust for biases in individual studies, and it provides all of this evidence transparently, usually in technical reports. 3IE has done a lot of work to ensure that these technical reports are published in user-friendly, jargon-free formats in what we call systematic review summary reports. These are available from the 3IE website. Thank you for watching this video, and stay tuned for more videos from 3IE on development effectiveness.